Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Alienware's Law Lessons of Saint. Today we got a meme with us. Hi guys, I'm Amin. I'm from the Mayo Clinic and I have a PhD in biomedical engineering. I design tools to be able to study the optimization of human performance. And today we're going to talk to you guys about visual processing. All right, two episodes ago we talked about the physiological aspects of pro gamers and then we talked about the mental aspects of pro gamers. And now we're going to dive a little bit deeper and talk about the key aspects such as visual processing and building good habits. What's interesting about esports is that we don't really know what the value is going to be associated with the physiology of what we do, right? We're kind of on the crest of it. We basically are coming to the conclusion that there's actually pretty cool information. To be honest, our objective is to get in there and to be as unobtrusive as possible. So this methodology would require little or no commitment from, from you guys. If it interferes with your performance, then we won't be using it. But the idea is to be able to take you in your natural state and to add this on the layer of data that analysts go through. Like when you first start with analysts, I'm not sure how much value you think they actually bring till they actually show you. So the hope is to kind of show you when we get to that point. Tell us a little bit about visual processing. Okay, visual processing is your ability to acquire information and to act upon that information in as concise a period of time as possible. Okay? It's really important because in a lot of other activities, it's also what sets apart the really great players from the average players. It's important in League of Legends for the same reasons. For example, a tennis player is able to deduce the movement of the ball from a serve where it's gonna go without even actually seeing the, the ball hit the racket. So just from the body motions of the player. So they extract so much more information from that one scene than an average player would. So that's basically the same as like a league pro looking at a map and be like, oh, well, this is or gonna be the next movement on the game. Or looking at a tab screen. I know when I tab, it takes me forever to figure out what I need to be looking at. But I noticed that a lot of pro players tab and in one or two seconds, they get the information that they want. Yeah, just and, about who gathers the information the fastest. Right, and we're gonna do a, a little series of experiments to figure that out. I'm Medias from Cloud9. I've been playing League of Legends for a little over four years and competitively on Cloud9 for the past year and a half. I recently just got back from the 2014 World Championship where my team placed top eight in the world. So now we're gonna do the same test that we did on a few people the other day, where we're gonna have you look at still shots and give me some information. We'll see what happens. So I want you to take a look at this picture and I want you to get all the information you can in the next 10 seconds. And then I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions and. Uh, Basically, I want to see how you would play this out. Okay, just take stock of who you are and what's going on, and uh, then we'll talk about it. All right, okay. so what are you going to do? What's going on? What did you notice? It, I'm as the Tristana here. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing I noticed was Tristana's team comp is pretty horrible. They actually have a comp that's full of physical damage. It was like yeah. Riven, Trindamir, Vi, Tristana, and then Janna, which adds more physical damage. And they really have no magic, so that on top of the fact that they have champions like Riven and Trindamir means that they're not going to scale well at all just because the other team can build armor so efficiently. So they're probably going to have to like snowball the game to win at that point, okay. just because when you can build armor and have it have like insane effectiveness, it's super hard to win. And then the other thing I noticed was the lane they were against is Vayn Thresh as Tristana Janet. So they should win that lane passively. What they have to watch out for is getting ganked because the other team had a Pantheon jungle who basically has to gank early. His farming's not very good. And so he'll probably end up camping that lane, but Tristana Janna is very hard to kill. So they should be fine playing aggressively, baiting Pantheon to come down there and waste their time and let their Vive farm up to six and go for a gank. Is sort of, if this is a competitive game, how I think it should play out. But so if you like anything happens. Okay, wonderful, beautiful. Um, did you pay attention to summoner spells at all? Uh, I didn't see anything too unordinary. Out of okay, spells. I mean, do you know how many teleports or ignites there are in oh. the game or exhaust? Did you notice that at all? I know, I wasn't looking at summoners. We're gonna, so all of these are gonna be a series from the same game. So now that you know the frame of the game, the next ones will just be a different situation. You'll capitalize on that. So why don't you go to the next picture? Kind of the same thing. This is a, about uh, a little bit more into the game. I want you to take a look at everything, and then I want I want you to tell me how the next 10-15 seconds are going to play out, or how you would play them out. 
All right. Okay. All right, so what it looked like was happening there was Trinomir is super low mid, no one else was mid against him, so I imagine he just got first blood really close. Uh, Riven was fighting Rumble in the Baron pit, and they were both really low too, so I imagine this fight going up there. I saw Vi was trying to level two invade Pantheon's red buff, and the bottom lane looked relatively even. So I imagine there's just a lot of fighting going on. What's probably gonna happen is Pantheon will get into a fight with Vi, the red, and Vayne Thresh is a lot better at fighting the jungle than Janna Tristana is because they have like so much CC. So I think that's not a very good invade from Vi, but I guess we'll see what happens. It seems it's pretty even because they hit level two first, the, the Thresh and Vayne, they go in, the other ones hit level two shortly after. What actually happened is that Pantheon went for the top red. You can't tell that oh, in that okay. picture. And that allowed Vi to invade the bottom red. And so as soon as these two hit two, they're going to go in for a fight, and then they get outplayed by Tristana, Janna, and Vi is actually there when they get okay. outplayed. So Vi comes and helps secure that fight. And so Pantheon was up here, which is why there was a bunch of stuff going on. Okay. All right, Makes so sense. perfect. If you want to go to the next slide, I can uh, show you a little bit more. All right. And so um, what happens is that they, because if they won, they, get, they end up snowballing a little, and they start playing very aggressive, okay? And uh, the team is slightly, and the upside is slightly flavored blue team in this one. So if yep. you want to go one more, um, here's the next picture that I want you to take a look at. So um, a team fight breaks out near the dragon pit. And I want you to take a look, tell me what's going on in this team fight. Tell me what you would do as Tristana in this situation and what are you watching out for? What are the key points you're looking for in a situation like this? All right, I'm gonna give you about five seconds. All right, so I'd say the key things going on in that fight are it looked like Vi was ulting Pantheon because Vi did get six before Pantheon uh, behind the red buff. So that's going to be their best focus target because Pantheon's easy to kill. The thing you have to watch out for is uh, actually getting initiated on by the level six Zed who's in the river. So because he was in an awkward spot in the dragon pit where he couldn't really hit anyone, he could either try to shoot Vayne over the wall when she goes to help the fight, or he could like jump up the river into like the pixel bush and start shooting Pantheon, but then he would have to probably flash the Zed ult just to keep from dying. So I imagine that's how he'd play it out. Actually, that's pretty close to how it happened. So you notice that the summoner spells was up and you picked up on the exact key points that are created. If Zed's ult's up, that's a big deal for that fight. Exactly. And if he does jump up, that's what he has to watch out for. It turns out that actually Zed's ult is not up in that fight. Okay. okay? And so as soon as the screen comes up, if you want to hit right, we can kind of walk through what happens in that fight. But he does jump up and he does end up using flash because he basically gets collapsed on. So if you want to go to the next screen, you'll see here that the Distrana used flash and heal and got over this part of the wall. Oh, did he jump He jumped here? right here. Okay, yeah. I, I would have jumped here to shoot the Pantheon. Okay, you would have jumped there. Very good. It's a safer position because if you jump here, you're like gonna guarantee get walled yeah. by the vein who's down here, and that's why he's forced to flash because that's yeah. that's what happened is that vein. So that, that's a little bit more awkward because if he was up here, yeah. he could have flashed basically like even here to get more into the fight, but just reposition or like really anywhere. But the fact that he had to flash out of the fight makes him a lot less effective. Something that very few people noticed is that Tristana was already casting jump here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you want to go again, just so what ends up happening is that they do kill the Pantheon. Tristana gets a reset, jumps in after Zed, who had no ult when this started. Yeah, but she just saw level six too. Yeah. Yep. And uh, he used level six in a little scuffle up here, I think, with Trindamir. But Vi manages to get away really luckily, and then they clean up and they snowball a little on the fight, and so they're, now they're even more ahead. So if you want to go to the next slide? So a lot of these fights have happened, it kind of, uh, and now I want you to take a look at the screen, it's a tab screen, I want you to take stock of the game, and your Tristana is backing. And I want you to tell me what you'd buy, what you'd do, what's the situation, where do you, where do you go? Alright, okay. I'm going to give you about five seconds. So as Tristana there, he had about a little over 800 gold. And at that point I think I would buy an Avarice Blade just because Tristana is not effective at all until she gets two items. You could get a crit coat there to get closer to your IE, but it's relatively similar stats to the Avarice Blade. And the Avarice Blade gives you the extra income obviously, which just gets you closer to those two items. So I would definitely go for that. And then it looked like they had already taken the bottom turret, so there's no real reason for him to go back bot. I imagine they would group up and maybe try to get the mid turret, but they do have like a really awkward comp for sieging with like triple melee on their team. So Tristana is really the only one who can. So 
their best bet might just be like taking vision control of bottom side and maybe even going back bot and just trying to snowball in the vein because Tristana with those items can like really bully vein. Mm -hmm. So just getting deep wars in the bottom jungle, pushing the vein in would probably be their best bet. Okay, that's great. What ends up happening is they do go mid. It's solo Q, so it's not that organized. Yeah. So they end up do going mid, just like you say, because that's obviously the best move. What I find really interesting is that you have a very heavy knowledge of the AD carry and the bullying. And the, is that just from being in the environment, playing with your teammates and listening to them so much? Or do you play it in solo queue a lot and practice it? Well, I'd say it's a combination of stuff. I play, I play normal games with my friends a decent amount. And whenever I play normals, I'm just like, trying out different heroes and okay. while I'm not playing against like the best players obviously I still get a feel for like how much damage each champion can mm -hmm. do and Tristana is strong in lane and sort of has power spike around level 6 especially with like BF pickaxe makes him pretty strong and Vayne's really weak right. like early game she's only good if she can like win her lane and snowball okay. up until the point where she has I guess her Bork she can start making plays but Tristana just has such a range advantage on her that it's really hard so I think that matchup's fairly heavily Tristana favored it's going to be a game of faker at mid. Okay. okay. And I want you to do the same thing. This is the first initial screen. I want you to kind of take stock of the game. Tell me what you see. First things that come to your mind and how you would play it out. I'm going to give you about five seconds. Okay. All right. So I was playing Warchish in summer this time. It seems both teams have a teleport. And faker's match at mid was Pantheon versus Fizz. Uh, Fizz started Cloth Armor, so it's going to be pretty hard for Pantheon to harass him down, but I think he still can. And his jungler was Lee Sin, and the other jungler was Nocturne. So Faker has the luxury of being able to basically play as aggressive as he wants, assuming that his Lee Sin is going to back him up. Because Nocturne's not really known for his early game ganks. If he has to waste too much time early game ganking, then he'll fall behind, and right, behind Nocturne is pretty worthless. So uh, the, the Nocturne's going to want to farm. He can hopefully make plays with Lee Sin on the Fizz and either harass him out by spamming spears at him or even go for a kill if the Fizz wastes his E and they get a stun on him. So that's probably how the early game would play out from okay. his perspective. Very cool. So you said you paid attention to more summoners. It's probably because I prompted the yeah. question earlier. But uh, did you notice how many teleports or how many ignites there were uh, on each team? I saw a teleport on each side. Okay, great. And I believe both the laners are ignite. Okay, great. Perfect. Despite your... Um, Excellent initial assessment. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that a situation developed. And I want you to take stock of the situation. I want you to say how that changes, if at all, the way you would play the mid matchup. Okay. Let me give you about five seconds. All right, so what looks like what happened there was Nocturne took red and level two ganked mid. And it kind of hurts Faker because Level one is when he can really like, you know, spam spears on Fizz whenever he goes up for CS and sort of get his initial lead on him. So he got hurt there, but uh, Faker didn't have to burn any summoners. He had Flask in a bunch of regions, so I don't think the amount that he got chunked will really affect anything. It'll also slow down Nocturne's jungle, which is good. And Faker should still be okay in that lane because the Lee Sin will be ahead of Nocturne. He can help him out if he needs it. Nocturne may have soaked some XP from Fizz when he came mid, so Fizz, despite being able to push on uh, Pantheon, because he got help, he might not get level 2 when he's expecting to just because he had to share some XP. Okay, wonderful. So, um, Faker and Fizz, and Pantheon and Fizz end up scrapping it. Scrapping it out, it's a pretty uh, quick fight. And I want you to take a look at the situation right now, and I want you to tell me, as Faker, what would you do in this situation? What are you looking for and what are you expecting? Alright. Give you about three more seconds. Even though you already sound ready. <laughs> Well, if that in that situation, I think Faker would win the fight because Fizz had no mana. So you would go for the fight? Yeah, I would go for it just because he had his block up from his passive, meaning he blocked Fizz's auto attack. Fizz, I don't think he has enough mana to cast anything. And Faker has 30, like, almost 40 mana, which is what his Q costs. And the Fizz is low enough to get crit. So I think an auto attack Q from Faker would kill Fizz. And I don't think he would die to Fizz right there. So did you notice if Flash was up or Ignite or anything like that? I, I think, pretty sure Faker... Well, I thought he had both summoners, but I, I could have seen it wrong. I did notice that Faker died once in lane. Okay, So yeah. he, he was disadvantaged. Yeah, so he died to Fizz earlier, and he managed to kill him. But you're right, Flock was up. And um, so Faker has Flash up. And so if Fizz gets away, and you Flash after him. In that situation, what would you do? Okay, so he had no Ignite. Uh, if you can get the auto attack on Fizz, it's worth flashing on him. 
but if you can't auto him, it's not worth it because it like if you flash on Fizz before he can flash, then you'll get the auto attack even if he flashes like while you're auto attacking, and then you're still in range to Q him. So like, I think yeah, he has 35 mana. He'd have to wait like almost a second. Then he can like flash auto attack and uh, spear Fizz probably kill him. You know that's exactly kind of what happens is that he waits that second and he turn and he goes to flash, but the Fizz flashes as well and he misses killing him by just just a little bit because okay. it's not enough. Um, all right, so lots of stuff has happened and now Faker is backing. There's a tab screen, kind of just assess the general situation. What do you do as Pantheon right now? What are you looking for? Where are you going to go? I'm going to give you about five seconds. Okay, so what I noticed there is that he's 3-1 and now, he's turning 0-1, which is good. He had about 1,400 gold with the Brutalizer, so I imagine the best thing he could buy would be like Pickaxe Boost or Pickaxe Longsword, just going for a Last Whisper, because this, he had a Cloth Armor, so I assume he's going for Seekers and Zonia early, so Last Whisper will let you like keep fighting Fizz effectively, and it's always up in 20 seconds, so depending on how the side lanes play, he could just buy and then immediately go gank one of the side lanes. Bot lane had a zillion, I believe. And I think his team had a Thresh, so that should be a pretty easy kill. But I don't really know if I'm gonna show up for the side lanes, so I think it would depend on that. Okay, wonderful. So you would look for an ult at the bottom lane? Basically. Bottom or top. And bottom or top. Because Faker's Flash is coming up in like 10 seconds okay. early. So in the next slide, a uh, situation is gonna develop and um, uh, we'll see what happens. So this is the situation, this is what he noticed. He's back in mid lane and he sees this. And I'm gonna let you look at five seconds. I'm gonna ask you what you would do. All right, so I think Faker would start heading towards bottom just in case they needed him. He could alt in, but I don't think he necessarily had to be there because they were really low and there was like a full HP at least on Thresh diving him. So I think just moving towards the bot lane, like sh giving his presence and having the ability to help out if needed would probably be the correct play there. Okay, so you think the man drop is not necessary? It might not be necessary. If the like Thresh and Lee Sin both hit their Qs, it's probably not gonna be needed. But if the fight drags out, like if the other team's bot lane starts flashing their abilities to survive under turret, then the man drop can like guarantee the kills. Okay, and are you worried at all about their jungler, their mid laner? Did you see them on the map at all? Uh, I did not see them on the map, but I, I guess it is a threat of Nocturne coming in, but the fact that their bottling was so low, and Pantheon's extremely good at tower diving, I wouldn't think about it a whole lot because he's pretty safe by blocking tower. It's shots. actually one of our freebie questions for the people who are doing this. It's, it's an easy yes to go down there, exactly. Like you said, and, and most people don't even consider all the things you consider, but that's their, they end up going down there, they get a 4-0 on the other guys, because they come one I guess one the, the one. thing he could have to watch out for, because Fizz and um, Nocturne are missing, if they were waiting for him to like yeah. start heading towards bot, they could kill him easily right there. So that's something you'd have to watch out for, but maybe he saw them recently or something, like yeah. maybe Fizz had to back, I'm not really sure. Uh, I mean, based off the, the picture knowledge, if you have you played that. Actually, all of it was very beautiful, thank you. That's wonderful, yeah. nice work, man. All right, thanks for joining us, man. We'll see you uh, in the LCS, hopefully. All right, see you. Bye. Let's transition from looking at still screens to how players perceive in-game action. Here's a chart of the time players spent in-game during the first 20 minutes from blue buff spawn. And what we're going to look at is one of two of the six categories of the score, the enemy portrait in the top left, the team portraits on the left, the character portrait, the cooldowns, and the minimap. Let's simplify and just look at how much time people spend on the cooldowns and the minimap. Now, first thing you'll notice is that Steve and I spend about 20% of our time, or about 180 seconds out of the 20 minutes, which is three minutes, looking at the these six categories. So I spend a disproportionately large amount of time looking at my cooldowns. Steve spends less time on his cooldowns, but a significant amount looking at his minimap. Boy Boy spends less time than both of us, especially not on his cooldowns, showing us that he's learned his cooldowns quite well. Cobb spends less time than anyone else looking at these portions of the screen. Almost no time on cooldowns. This could be a virtue of being an AD carry with a support watch in your back. The Diamond 4 player 
spends a large amount of time looking at his cooldowns, while the Silver 3 spends no time looking at much at all, which means that his awareness is pretty low. Now, let's transition to a few heat maps that will show a little bit more information at a glance. Here is the first heat map I want to look at. It is a picture of Boy Boy playing mid and his gaze pattern. So what I want you to pay attention is the top left showing that the red dots, the more red, the more intense the area, the more the vision was fixated there during the 20 minutes. Um, in Boy Boy's case, the maximum amount of time on a point is 12.44 seconds. So you'll see, just like we showed, he spends a fair amount of time on his mini-map in the center of the screen. Here's a special playing a support character. You'll notice he does pretty much the same thing, and only also about 12 seconds. You will notice that he spent a lot of time being distracted in chat, though. Here is Cop playing AD Carry, and you'll see that he spends about 15 seconds and is the most intense case point looking at the minimap. Almost nothing at his cooldowns, but also quite a bit at chat. This scatter here is, is quite evenly distributed, showing he fired many targets. Let's move to Saint, who's a jungler. If you noticed before, the highest we had was 14 seconds. We've jumped to 35, and that's at the minimap. It's basically by virtue of a jungler, possibly, could use the minimap a lot more, as you'd expect. Here's our Diamond 4. Everything's just a big glob in the center of about 74 seconds at its most intense point. Similarly, even bigger glob at the center for our silver three of about 85 seconds with nothing in the periphery. Let's take a look at more adept players but still not pro. You see Steve's pretty similar to professional's gaze distribution except that he spends a lot more time. Instead of 12 to 15 seconds he's 20 to 25 seconds just as our charge showed. Here's me. I don't really fixate in one point for too long with 12 seconds being the most on my minimap and my cooldown, but after knowing this and going home and playing and consciously removing my mind from cooldowns, I was able to immediately change my behavior and spend a lot of my time away from the cooldowns and focusing on the minimap. Although it's a lot more than Saint, but it's probably by virtue of being a jungler looking at the minimap. So we learned, learn your cooldowns, keep map awareness, and practice fluid vision. Tell me a little bit about how you change your bad habits and how you develop new habits that you know you need to do. Well, I think first it's about identifying what your bad habit is. Um, maybe it's you don't really look at the lanes enough or you don't ward enough. And, and that's what this show is for, right? To help people identify their habits, their yeah. bad habits, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, so basically if you don't ward enough, get into the habit of like, all right, it's on my first back, I'm going to buy a ward every time, no matter what. Or if it's seven minutes, I'm always going to get these items. Or I'm always going to do this and just make it your goal in the game. It doesn't matter if you win or lose the game, like that doesn't, who cares about that? I don't care about your ELO, anything like that. Uh, just make sure at the end of the game, you're like, oh, I got the ward at that time, nice. I got the deep ward in here at that time, nice. And you've accomplished your mini goals. And eventually, you'll, it'll become repetition and it'll just be something you do every single game without having to think about it. Can you tell us about a bad habit that you may have changed and how you did that? Uh, I think like I have a really big problem about being over aggressive a lot. And yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if I'm going into a situation where I know that I'd usually play it over aggressive, I just stop and I think about the situation for like an extra second or like an extra second and a half. I mean, it may not sound like much, but it'll allow me to like, because I've gotten so many bad situations, I got it in, like I've told myself like, I'm going to wait that extra second before I decide to like hard engage into like their whole team and die. Um, and since I like, I've been building up this habit, I'm slowly like becoming much smarter about how I pick and choose my fights. Who are you playing? Um, uh, I didn't take note of that. Yeah, I saw Pantheon Jungle, um, I think. That was on the, <laughs> the red team, maybe. So oh my god. <laughs> this one's hard. <laughs> okay. <laughs>